So hi, I'm Philip Krieger, and um, today is June 13th, 2022. I had to think there for a minute. And I'll be talking about poetry and reading selections from my out of print, or almost out of print book, Roses, A Book of Verse, which I published in 1989. Um, I've also um, created a lot of poetry since 1989 and was hopeful of putting that into a second book. But at this stage of the game, I think it'll be easier and maybe even better just to um, speak them out and have them on um, YouTube. So we'll see about all that. But um, today what I want to do is read selections from the book, Roses, a Book of Verse. But before that, I'd like to speak a little bit about poetry and what Baba had to say about it, and also about what's not poetry and what Baba had to say about that. So um, let's see. Okay. Baba said, very few people can compose poetry. He had Alaba recite Hafez and thereafter said, Hafez's composition is true poetry. The selection of words, the flow of the language, and the style to convey more meaning in a few words directly appeals to the heart. By the way, I have citations from where in the literature Baba said all these things, but I'm not going to bother with that now. Um, this man named P. N. Limkar expressed a desire to read a poem composed by himself. Baba said, there is no poetry in it. Limbar responded, Baba, there is feeling in it. Agreed, Baba said, but there is no poetry in it. After someone recited several poems, Baba remarked, this is not poetry, it is your views. Where there is an experience of love, that is poetry. And this is from uh, Francis Brabazon, who I consider the greatest poet of our times. Francis writes, the poet laureate they decide shall be he who is best supply, who has best supplied them with their grunts, squeals, versified, in meters matching their short stride. Woohoo! <laughs> Francis didn't hold back. There's a book by a man named David Orr called Beautiful and Pointless, A Guide to My Modern Poetry. And he says that a, a lot of alleged poetry is simply a Christmas tree of words linked by the hope that the anti-discipline of poetic modernism will make anything acceptable. I think Ross Keating has uh, quoted him before. And Ross is a true poet, in my opinion. There's an old Arab proverb. When the king puts the poet on the payroll, he cuts off the tongue of the poet. There are words that describe um, poetry, so-called poetry. One of the terms is doggerel. Some people might be familiar with it. And someone that writes doggerel is called a poetaster. <laughs> and there's a phrase, poeticism. It's an archa archaic, trite, or strained expression in poetry, according to Webster's Dictionary, Ninth Collegiate Dictionary. Page 907. Um, Baba pointed out, if there is honesty in a man, he can compose large volumes of poetry. But if the fundamental basis of his writing is only show and hypocrisy, nothing he writes will last, even though the entire world bows down to you or respects you, you cannot raise your head that is to say, advance. I absolutely abhor hypocrisy. 
Okay, Baba said, shifting now to real poetry, poets, music composers, composers, writers, and artists also at attain vibrations of subtle inspiration temporarily. From the subtle world, inspiration comes to them and they feel inspired to write music, poems, epics, and create art. Elsewhere, Baba said, instinct governs the animal world, intellect, humans. Inspiration for those humans whose feelings are developed like poets and artists. Intuition is for those advanced souls who have conscious visions and understanding true to the point. What you understand by intuition is also true. What you understand by intellect is sometimes true and sometimes not. Baba said, after mastery of reason comes intuition which is the plane on which the poets write. And then Baba had um, a favorite contemporary poet named Jigger. Some people may have heard of him. According to the footnote in Lord Mayher, Jigger was not on the subtle planes or a salik, but his poetry was genuinely inspired from the subtle world. Jigger did not have continual divine inspiration, but he had the inspiration of the subtle world. And only when he would write did he have it. This inspiration was therefore temporary when he was writing and not lasting, as is the state of the subtle or mental conscious salik. In other words, poets can be gross plain but inspired at the time through the subtle. Okay, Baba said, I'm sorry, Thomas Carlyle said, <laughs> he who can read a poem well is a poet. And Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi, the perfect masters, <clears throat> said, love is the reality and poetry is the drum that calls us to that. Prophet Muhammad, the avatar of the time, said, God hath, hath treasures beneath the throne, the keys whereof are the tongues of poets. Um, there's a passage in Martin Ling's book, Muhammad, His Life, based on the earliest sources, um, says, towns during Muhammad's time, towns were places of corruption. Sloth and slovenliness lurked in the shadows of their walls, ready to take the edge off a man's alertness and precious possessions. Few of the Arabs could read, but beauty of speech was a virtue which all Arab parents desired for their children. A man's worth was largely assessed by his eloquence, and the crown of eloquence was poetry. To have a great poet in the family was indeed something to be proud of, and the best poets were nearly always from one or another of the desert tribes, for it was in the desert that the spoken language was nearest to poetry. And um, it mentions the word eloquence there. Here's what Inayat Khan said. Poetry in which the soul is expressed is as living as a human being if I were to say that the greatest beauty that God bestows on man is eloquence, poetry, it would not be an exaggeration. Francis Brabazon, who Baba called the modern Hafez, said, Love delights in poetry and parables. Of itself it is sure. Mind demands the prose of logic because it is insecure. Let the demander question and sort, for trash is his treasure. The lover has another occupation, his beloved's pleasure. That's from In Dust I Sing, my favorite poetry book. Ezra Pound said, poetry is news that stays news.
<laughs> I'm chuckling because of this one. It's, um, it's an anonymous quote. Poets and pigs are only appreciated after their deaths. Percy Bysshe Shelley, or Bishy Shelley, I'm not sure how to say it, whom Baba liked as a poet, said, all high poetry is infinite. It is the first acorn which contained all oaks potentially. Veil after veil may be undrawn and the inmost naked beauty of the meaning nearer exposed. After one person in one age has exhausted all its divine effluence, which their particular relations enable them to share, another and yet another succeeds. Regarding poetry, Baba noted uh, it was important to get the meter before composing the poems. In my own experience, it all just kind of happens. I don't understand it exactly. This is my book that I alluded to earlier, Roses, a Book of Verse, put out in 1989. It contains um, poetry from a selection of poems that I wrote from 1970 to 1988. Most of the poems in the book, there are 43 of them, um, are from 1987-1988. After I s published this book, I sent copies to India and received um, some messages back. Bama too wrote, Congratulations, dear Philip, for sharing with the readers the fragrance of roses that blossomed in your heart. All at Merizad joined me in sending their best wishes in Baba's love and ever-loving smile. Love in him, Balna too. And Mani wrote me, I'll just read a section of it. Speaking of the Mandali, she says, we love to read your poems to Baba. And then she writes other things about the book. I'm sorry, that was Balna too. Oops. <laughs> this is for Mani. Dear Philip, I have been wandering in your garden of roses and found each rose bearing the fragrance of beloved Baba's love. Thank you for sharing his beauty. May your heart sing his praises always. J. Baba and love from your Merizad family, Mani. It just shows how loving the Mandali were for whatever efforts we made in our, uh, at our level of loving. <laughs> what an inspiration and joy it was to have known them and learned things at their knee and felt their love. Thank you, Baba. So, um, the book Roses, from which I'm going to read some selections, um, I probably won't read the notes to the poems, which are quite extensive and might give better understanding, but um, we'll see. Um, I did want to say that when I told Kitty I was writing such a book, she was very um, helpful and gave me a key to the center library and said, go in any time, you can unlock the cabinets and get the um, old material that isn't out on the shelves to work on your notes that help um, explain the poems better for people that um, want that sort of help. And if they don't, they don't have to read the, um, the notes, of course. So, um, I do want to mention, I guess now's a good time to mention it, that my second book will be called Fragrance, um, and perhaps, and perhaps not, subtitled Atmospheric Poems for a New Humanity. Um, and so, um, Fragrance, at least, will be the the working title. And as I think I mentioned before, um, it might not be actually put forth in book form because, well, I'm 75 now, have some chronic conditions and it's a bit much. Anyway, it's nice to have the words spoken out. It gives an extra something to them. So the first poem in the book is called How Roses Make Good Sense. 
I drew so close to beauty's place that God dissolved illusion's face. A flood of tears began to gush and fell upon this thorny bush, the one which shielded heaven's prize and tore the veil from mortal eyes. With light and warmth from up above, a wealth of blossoms burst with love. A bouquet offering for his feet, returned in praise for pain so sweet. Thus silent rain and sun commenced to yield the flowers which yield the scents. And should this fragrance bring delight, rejoice in him who shineth bright. I think I'll read the second one too. Of course, these speak to uh, heightened experiences which aren't the everyday experience of moi, <laughs> but they are helpful. This one's called I'm All Wet. Oh, the power in his radiant silence, jumping out from everything. Nothing now can be withheld from this empty cup I bring. In this moment, mind voice stammers. How could I have been so blind? <laughs> How could I have been so blind? In his courtyard, heart voice bursts. Oh my God, you are so kind. <laughs> I don't want to leave this heaven. Draw me further under still. I can't bear to leave this splendor. Hold me here against my will. Yes, I know I haven't earned it. Yes, I know I must return. Softly now into re-entry, there's so much I must unlearn. God, you are so perfect, Baba. God, you are so beautiful. But now your wish is manifest, and so I must be dutiful. I'll be back, of this I'm certain. That's our promise made both ways. I'll come back, your melted snowman snowman when ego here no more displays we're like two boys inside a clubhouse drawing up a secret pact blood brothers sworn to stay together right up through the final act i want to sing i want to dance i'm driven by your smiling face friend of friends i'll die for you to win the chalice of your grace And this one is called Man Overboard, or The Father is Child to the Man. And there's a footnote to the word man. It's man or woman, both the same, when seen from God's perspective, which can be gained by shipwrecked souls whose vision's non-selective. A little boy is lost inside the man he has become. The world entrapping innocence has left him deaf and dumb. But still, inside the troubled sea, the peril remains untainted and waits for man to free it from the world which he has painted. When finally the man is brave and sees the sun within, he jumps the ship which he had made and washes off his sin. Abandoning the ship of life is only the beginning. There yet remains the mystic goal our seaman would be winning. While flailing in the ocean's waves, the child impels him deeper. His boat has sunk, no shore in sight, but this man is no weeper. No longer does he gasp for air. He gets lost in the ocean. That's when the father mothers him sustaining every motion. High diving to the very core without a selfish care. No harm can come to one who goes where only heroes dare. Now, now nothing lives except the goal for such a one as this. And nothing veers the true man's heart, not agony or bliss. It's then reunion at its depth is sealed in love's embrace. And gaining what was never lost is known in God's one face. The rising sun, S-O-N, within the man then surfaces to light and sails to shore for landlocked men who yearn for pearled sight. 
Not all return to light of day to share the prize they've won, but all are destined to regain the Father through the Son. Seaworthiness will come in time to all who leave the beaches and walk the plank of their free will in ocean's furthest reaches. Though bound and gagged, not seen or heard, to jump is your best bet. To take the plunge in total faith ensures you won't get wet. For this enjoins the one above to cater to his lover, to part the seas for faithful man, for what he must discover. For fathomless within the sea, he serves as Pearl's mother and safely holds for honest man what's lost to any other. Unlike the poem by Coleridge, where endlessly men suffer, our, our captain plays the perfect role and gives the proper buffer. And though each sailor after him has his own albatross, the final chapter that he writes means giving up the cross. And so the circle of our lives comes full because of him, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, as known and are known as one within. No story tale could ever be so perfectly sublime as that which sails the seven seas, our ancient mariner's rhyme. This next one's called, It's Time. We live in a wild time where there is no time, but everyone's looking for a good time. Yet beyond the opaque slime in which the senses dine, and beyond the treacherous world of the literate mind, lies the pristine beauty of the perfect rhyme, singing silently to all who have the guts to take the fall from expectations big and tall, till they are rendered oh so small, enabling them to heed the call. Ah, what could be more difficult than over oneself to somersault amidst the myopic explosion of spiritual erosion and the human injection of muck and infection? But the poem, capital P, meaning the avatar, I guess, has been written and those who have been smitten hold on to the living word that silently is heard, for nothing can take apart what he's spoken in the heart. Coda, you are so beautiful, so beautiful you are. And uh, some of these poems I would write differently or not write at all, or modify a little bit. And this next one is, um, I guess what you would call another hard-hitting one. I see some things differently now. It's called Dream Within a Dream, The American Dream. And underneath it I have caution. This dream could prove hazardous to your way of living. Take only as directed in the supplementary notes. <laughs> Impressions with community standing, material gain and family planning, expensive cars and great big houses, spoiled kids, go-getter spouses, one nation's ego trickles down until it goes the world round. Whatever it dooms acceptable, the world pro proclaims delectable. The firstest, mostest, bestest, greatest, obtain whatever is called the latest. It's freedom to enslave your soul in bondage to the ego's goal. Paint your eyes black and blue, red for blood on cheeks will do. Adulterate your nails and hair. Let fashion dictate what you wear. Clothes make the man you understand. Lick the boot or you'll be banned. Necktie noose around your neck. You're making money, what the heck? Rats win the race who swallow blindly. Gotta keep them mice behind me. It's not pretty what we do. Shellac ourselves with Maya's glue. Cigarettes and alcohol. Unnatural food, all typical a daily dose of TV crap, while shelves of great books take a nap. Society's rules become our habit. If conscience nags, we quickly, quickly stab it. Our culture's ways we rationalize. His silent voice wears our disguise. He didn't say we couldn't. 
Can't hear him say I shouldn't. Unpluck your ears and listen deep. Rouse your conscience from its sleep. Don't defend your worldly ways by hiding in illusion's maze. Energy that's misdirected leaves its buyers gross infected. To take the trinkets of this age is not the way to spend one's wage. Leave all excess where you find it. What you have claimed, post haste, resign it. Wake up from the American dream, the Kali Yuga's perfect scheme. It's not too late to kill ambition and murder safety through contrition. To taste humility's refreshment and give away your life's investment. To take stock of the world internal and take leave of all ways infernal. You're left without when you look within instead of following world spin. Turn your back from prosperity track. They'll turn their backs and cut no slack. What a price to pay for courage, dismissed as failures with a flourish. But what reward in ruin is granted, in Meher's song one is planted. At last you see you're hopeless, voiceless, and truly know you're helpless, choiceless, defenseless now, except for him. You're free at last to sing God's hymn, free at last to kiss the seal, free at last to work for real, free at last to lay no claim, free at last to play his game. Wake up, wake up, hear what he said, reject your life for living dead. One way or other all must follow, so take the, le the lead and become hollow. Dream of him, not this or that, forget to swim and drown the rat. The racing mind can then awake to serve the heart for Baba's sake. The pure and simple lose it all and live a new life through his call. The dream then finished, all is won by Baba's grace, a job well done. This next one is called Love is His Name. I would love to be able to honestly say that fame and women, power and pay have nothing on me, no bondage or sway. But truth be known, I am definitely caught in Maya's tight net which my ego has sought. And I must pay the price, since I'm the offender, of effacing myself in total surrender. Thank God I have God. <laughs> to help me along as I'm changing my tune to his divine song. No way could I do it, nowhere would I be, if his very self was not shining on me. He is the answer, he is the one, the glory, the power, the eternal son. Love is his name, love is his way, and because of his love, we will join him one day. You're so clever. I don't know how you come up with <laughs> They just came to me. Wow. I explained that in the introduction or preface to the book, that uh, I never prepare a poem in advance. Sometimes I have to wait a year for a poem, and other times I've got three in a day. The meter, everything just comes to me. It's like pieces of a puzzle, and I piece them together. So, this one's called Springtide. Creation of the universe seems lacking in emotion. The elements were brought about through energy's explosion. But truth be known, the story is that God, he had a notion and manifested everywhere, though veiled through love's implosion. Re-enter God as avatar, who is the perfect potion. He lubricates the world of forms and serves as cleansing lotion. The rhythm, the rhythm of his universe is poetry in motion, unending waves on shoreless shore, the life beneath commotion. Invisible to mortal eyes, we live within this ocean, and when the springtide rushes in, our hearts spill out devotion. Huh. This one is called Fire Eaters and Treasure Chests. So many jests yet can't explain, 
can, yet can explain upon whose chest the cross is lain. He slowly dies in secrecy who purifies this mimicry. Those who aspire to be set free must eat the fire of self-debris, must smile sweet and seal the lip from scorching treat, no smoke must slip. From smoke to fires, if held within, a light transpires from burning sin. It's then we see our chests of ash and consciously our jests rehash. Burnt offerings, we, well, burnt offerings we then give to him and pray that he might have the whim, the whim to blow upon the coals so that we'll glow for other souls. So that we might as embers be, remaining bright through memory, the memory of the living sun who burns with love till all have won, have won the, have won, won the quests and ease the pains within our hearts where he remains. It's he alone who still resides where hearts of stone had ruled the tides. Once well concealed by strangers there, all chests must yield God's love they bear. This treasure hunt we all shall win, the self we seek who hides within. This next one is called, Good Night Moonlight, Be Mine Sunshine. <laughs> it's, uh, has to, it was inspired by a relationship I had. Dear Moon, I'm, unre I'm unable to rightly convey to you what the tone of my life tries to say to you. The heart sounds from an instrument broken up, our harsh noise to a soul not yet woken up. Therefore, I must be silent all through the night, since my truth gains no entry into your light. But to him what I spoke was love calling out, not the wrath of a yesteryear's falling out. He responds to an honest man's soulful peal from beneath a full harvest moon's woeful heel. Underfoot in the darkness and ground to bits, that is where I found out there's no sound that fits. Through the healing, could be pronounced two different ways, H-E-E-L is one way. To the, through the healing which grinds out great sorrowing, God eclipses the light, the light that you're borrowing. Thus he shows one the source of the glowing sphere, now that silence has found room for growing here. Drinking moonshine's an age-old bad habit, boys. Though the sun shines, a moon child will grab at toys, and the crushing hangover that comes along makes a moonstruck disciple howl out his song. That's until, as I've said, there is no recourse but to turn silent, soundlessly to the light's true source. This is where I have been for a long time now, since exposed to your foot like the airborne cow. Cow jumps over the moon. Can you hear who is calling out silently, or is love still unheard except violently? I can't say who I'm sending this letter to. That depends on your orbiting point of view. Are you false glow still teasing with borrowed light, or a new moon arising in heaven's night? It's a cosmic illusion, this much I know, since I've now lost my head from your footloose show. Truly, moon dust. Then I have a P.S. to the letter. By the way, that you, did you know that I'm changing my name? Ever since my appetite for cold green cheese began to wane, it never really satisfied me anyway. In the next moment, I'm, I'd be hungrier than ever. The name Sunbeam has figured prominently in my consciousness. What do you make of that? Well, it may take a long time to satisfactorily affect this change but it rapidly is becoming my one burning desire. Incidentally, I've been seeing a new friend, a very old friend actually, who has clearly brightened up my day. I have to be honest with you, Moon. You can't shed light on things the way he does. Capital H. I find what he says to be true, that your glow is all show, a surface thing. 
and you may not find this to be a sunny thought, but he says that side of you which appears so alive and bright is also the dark side of the moon. Furthermore, he says, moonstruck, dead duck, sunshine, life divine, and that's not all. He says that continuing to involve myself with you is sheer lunacy. I am committed to him and vice versa. You do what you have to do, Moon, but I cannot see you any more like before. Post postscript. Oh, I almost forgot that I wanted to share this joke, this jest with you. It's the one about the difference between involvement and commitment being like the difference between a breakfast of scrambled eggs and a breakfast of bacon. You see, in the first situation, the chicken was involved. In the last case, the pig was committed. You know, now that I think about it, we've already shared this joke with differing fates. You went on, as I recall, to spread your um, sense of humor elsewhere, whereas for me, this joke was a real showstopper. <laughs> I get along fine with that person now, by the way. So. Um, this one is called, In God We Trust or Else. In God we trust, or else in mind so limited, our choice. The mind's a bust, it sends us reeling with its thoughts, such noise. The heart will rust when thinking drowns the silence God enjoys. Pure faith resuscitates our hearts to serve as sound life buoys. And though we're cussed by leading minds whose condescension cloys, the times august to separate the heroes from the boys, we live as dust or else the life a normal man deploys. So don't be fussed because the truth accepts no cheap alloys. Eschew the crust and dare to live by inner faith, his voice, to readjust our very lives and be his true envoys. It's time we must rely on heart's directive power, rejoice. Remain nonplussed to seeming walls within the world, mere toys. The God-man's gust of heavenly grace, the faithful one employs. This love is just, and put in action with the walls, destroys a loving thrust that grows into the state of perfect poise. So what's, enjoy, so what's unjust within this world when faith confronts decoys? Dare not distrust his perfect plan because the mind annoys. In God we trust, or else in mind so limited, our choice. Hmm. I don't know if I should read that one or not. <laughs> I'll just give the title of it and not read it. She couldn't feel. Um, so as, you're, as you might be finding out, the poems are either mostly directly about Baba or about how I brought Baba into my understanding of problematic relationships. That's the story in this book. It's not so much the story in my book, Fragrance, which I'm not yet reading from. This is called On the Beach, Diamonds in the Rough. We walk upon the shifting sand. Our lower selves seek solid land. But then there's also ocean's call, and higher self cannot withdraw. There is no doubt we're in the middle, we want to cry or shout or piddle. Jobs are lost and best friends leave. Dear ones die, ex-lovers grieve. Play is rare and work's a grind. You lose your health, you lose your mind. <laughs> Promises go down the drain and money is a constant strain. To the mind, it makes no sense. Unfair pain, no recompense. This isn't what we bargained for bereft on ocean's desert shore. Our youth has waned and we are whining. On loneliness and fear we're dining. There's also anger, lust, and greed. How few of us from these are freed. But then, of course, it's like he told us, we have to let his grinding mold us. 
Right now our feet are not so steady, but in this night he makes us ready. Where the lantern sets to rest, there the darkness cloaks his best. And underneath protective veil, his jewels he grinds in fine detail. We needn't know the what's and why's. He feels the pain of all our cries. He's cutting deep and chiseling fine in Myrtle Beach's diamond mine. Some chipping there, some drilling here. <laughs> the age of light is drawing near. The time is sooner than we know. Hold on, hold on, and don't let go. Take heart, take heed, endure this lot. He'll give us everything he's got. We are his gems, he's told us this. The hour is close for sunlight's kiss. And when this work on us is done, he'll free us to the high noon sun. Then rainbow light will sparkle there, <laughs> reflecting Baba everywhere. Right now we feel his holy flame. We bite our tongues and call his name. But when the light of day we see, we'll praise his ways eternally. We'll live forbearance, not for gain. We'll give our lives in lover's lane. We'll stand rock solid, not on sand. In ocean's light, we'll play our hand. But irregardless of our fate, to love him one cannot be late. He loves no matter who you are, for he is Baba, Avatar. Oh. This is a short one, it's called The Lesson. The lesson to learn is for what to yearn, to whom to turn, and how to burn. Continuing on this burning theme, this one's called Wildfire. I say your name is Wildfire, the one beyond control, who dashes dreams and smashes schemes, the guardian of my soul. I say your name is Wildfire, relentless searing flames. I play my part, you burn my heart, the deadliest of games. I say your name is Wildfire, I want to scream and shout. I can't complain, though half insane, I cannot do without. I say your name is Wildfire, I'm trapped on every side. You take no heed, you make me bleed and burn away my pride. <laughs> I know your name is Wildfire. Your blazing light doth call. I feel the heat when at your feet. You are my all in all. <laughs> Thank God you are my Wildfire, the all-consuming one. So strike the match, ignite this thatch. With this, thy will be done. Moving on from a fiery poem to a, a watery poem, this one is called From Sea to Shining Sea. And um, it's one that benefits from being read on the page too because of, of the way I put the words and designs. Round we go until we step off the wheel of our lives into the unseen source of life where we can really see forever and ever to be at sea or not to be depends upon the motion that we agree to take at sea in channeling emotion. To be made free in step with thee, we must get past the notion that we are free to ride the sea without ego, ego's erosion. So we must flee that self you see, that spinning wheel of fortune and see not we in life, but thee, to swim the shining ocean. And this one is called Out of Sight, In Sight. It's a very short one. Crazy Eyes was rolling on the floor all through the night, twisting and contorting, making sure he got it right. The worldly focused people wished to put him out of sight but Crazy Eyes was only making sure he saw the light. <laughs> this next one is called Real Power. And I remember um, I read it in India at a, at, a pro at a program. 
And uh, one of the longtime residents there came up afterwards and said, I really don't like poetry, but I really like that poem. <laughs> so, anyway. Real power. A power exists which cannot be seen except by those who begin the beginning. It's here, right inside, of those who have traded visible might for life consecrated, found in the heart, not on a banner, and working in a quiet manner. It shines in its silence, though quite unassuming, and it seems to the world that nothing is blooming. But roses are there, just for the taking, should anyone's heart be divinely aching. From sight of rose to sting of thorn, then flowing blood till we're reborn. What power is this he gives to any who sacrifice this world of plenty? Where pleasures have been, suffering follows until joy comes along to fill all the hollows. Cross and candle all in one, God power serves till we're undone. So sing to him, become his dinner. You must lose to be the winner. The lion of love must devour to share with us his humble power. Blessed are we to have the chance for ego death and real romance. Sing to Baba and he will give power in the transforming rain of his love shower. So, mentions the thorns there. On the cover of my book, Roses, the picture of Baba is outlined by thorns, because roses also have thorns. And that was Jim Meyer's idea, who helped with the, uh, the layout of the cover. I'm glad he did that. This one is called Happy Hour. <laughs> Where is she, the flower I need, my missing loving link? Every hour I go without, my spirits sadly sink. Forty-one and counting down, it seems too late to drink the nectar from ambrosial bloom, which passes in a blink. In hopes of catching perfume scent, I'm standing on the brink. But up till now, my luck is down to nodding and a wink. The natural beauty I must have has turned my blood to ink, but spilling out these dying words might cause my love to think, might cause the blossom of my dreams to overcome my stink, to breathe her fragrant air this way, thus making distance shrink. And should I somehow catch the wind which puts, out, which puts our lives in sync, Beholder and beholden we will live life in the pink. So raise a toast and hope to hear your mug with wine glass clink. For dreams come true just at the hour it seems too late to drink. This might be one that I'll read the notes to because I think it gives a... I forget what I wrote, but here it is. This poem had been brewing for quite a while before it came into being on May 5th and 6th, 1988. It developed quite differently from the direction that it first appeared to be taking, but that is not at all an, an uncommon occurrence. Below are, some, below are some points regarding this poem. The word 41 refers to my age at the time the poem was written, and using the phrase counting down as opposed to counting up the years is purposefully suggestive. Referring to the sought-after loved one in the feminine, she and her, allows the reader to view the poem as a tale of worldly love, as well as divine love, while at the same time accentuating the beauty conversant with the guzzles of Baba's favorite poet, Hafez, while at the same time accentuating the beauty aspect of the divine the beloved, who is the real focus. Those who are conversant with the guzzles of Baba's favorite poet, Hafez, are familiar with this multi-level application of feminine symbolism. In a similar vein, the poem's language seemingly refers to such things as the bogus happy hours publicized by run-of-the-mill taverns and the mundane yearning for romantic love. But in truth, I'm talking about the real deal, the divine love proffered at the master's tavern during the truly happiest of hours. 
And this uh, has similar symbolism, this next poem, it's a short one. It's called Looking Up, Passing Out. It's when the glass of life I drain and look down from the top, I see the night through window pane instead of bottoms up. But when I tilt the ruby red in lieu of nickel beer, I lose my footing in my head and bid my host good cheer. The friendly tavern keeper he smiles down upon the floor where I have lost all sense of me and call to him for more. Just in that moment from his eye the dawn comes pouring through and in his light I heave a sigh while passing out of view. This is another one that um, you could take a picture of. And what I failed to do was have arrows going down from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All good children go to heaven. Anyway, the tomb, or as Bama II called it, the T-O-O and the N, the B standing for timeless one, Meher Baba. We walk up the hill to lay down our heads at the feet of the highest. Our burdens we spill, and his silent grace spreads to lovingly quiet us. These minds are then still. We awake from our beds and allow him to guide us. The world becomes nil when slavery thus weds the master inside us. It is living his will when this path one treads to the God-man's dais. So take God on a hill to unweave the threads which sanskarically tie us and joyfully swill the compassionate meds with which he supplies us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all God's children go to heaven. Um, this next one is one that um, Jane Haynes particularly liked and thought would be helpful to other people and so she asked me for a copy and handed out copies to people. By the way, Kitty, I forgot to mention Kitty Davy was an inspiration for me to actually uh, put out this book and I was too shy to read the poems for many years. <laughs> Transformation. He remapped my life and restored my soul. He cut like a knife and removed the whole, H-O-L-E. He showed me the nothing which he had excised, and this was everything unto mine eyes. Yes, a glory bestowed by his powerful sword. Truth again marches on by the grace of my Lord. These grapes had been trampled, and wrath was my fame. A fermenting heart was all I could claim till the fruits of my heart, which I gave out for free, were reclaimed by love and given to me. For one day he called me to drink my own cup, the blood from my heart he bade me to sup. I seized the vessel and did blissfully dine on the miracle treasure of his vintage red wine. I drank and I drank and I drank it all in. So this was the way to vanquish all sin. Dizzy with love and drunk with all, I turned the corner and took a great fall. I fell into love, capital L, and stopped at a gate with ticket in hand. He asked me to wait. I don't mind though, I'm happy as can be, for there's light pouring out and it's shining on me. There's nothing to say now, Everything's fine. He pulled me loose and announced, you're mine. There's only perfection in his divine plan. He's poet and pauper, God and man. Now that he's killed me with moonshadow's light, then pulled me back up to heavenly sight. Tongue is gone and past is dead. Future is here in present stead. I wait at the gate and quietly smile, calm and still all the while. I leave me there while in the world, carrying out his present hurl. 
this new, new life that came from thee in, honor to, in answer to my anguish plea cannot be told, cannot be seen, and yet he knows just what I mean. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, keep me in line, I haven't forgotten the taste of that wine, nor have I neglected to recall the despair of how I did tumble from heavenly stare. But now I'm renewed, he responded to me, what choice is there now but to go silently? So Baba, oh Baba, this is the end, the new beginning on which you send this drop soul of wine covered with me till it sings for all time. Oh me thee, oh me thee. I mentioned in the introduction to the book that my past history with poetry I still have a poem that I wrote when I'm nine year old, was nine years old, that transported me somewhere, even though it was just about a balloon that burst on one level, but it was about much more than that. And when I was 10, my father had us writing haiku. We had a Japanese exchange student living with our family for a year. And um, so this next poem is a haiku. It's very short. What else was I going to say? Oh, but I, it really didn't take off for me writing poetry until I went away to college. And then uh, that's when it sort of all began. This is called Haiku for a High You. Honesty and love and gender involution. Seek and you shall find. So this one is called Let's Get Naked. The naked truth is all around. Undress your soul to hear its sound. Sweet silent music there for all who halt their march for baby's crawl. When innocence approaches him, unveiling then becomes his whim. Unzip the heart from its rib cage and hand it to our silent sage. The real McCoy is then exposed and shocks the mind out from its clothes. This time is true epiphany, bare facts that need no litany. This lovely sight which has been born, when from our rags we have been shorn, allows the soul to frolic free and greet our maker naturally. So drop the fig leaf, so drop the fig leaf of illusion and take the path to holy fusion. Just send your clothing back to hell and walk with him, O oh natural. Okay. <clears throat> this is another one that um, is a hard-hitting poem, and I would change some things in it now, but um, and a lot of things I wouldn't change. It's called I Do Not Have, or the Wild Rose Poem. And a statement right underneath the title says, Warning, this poem, and even more so the extensive explanatory notes located in the back of the book, are industrial strength medicines and can only be properly assimilated by those who are prepared to handle strong stuff. Should a reaction set in, please consult your conscience at once. <laughs> so, as I say, um, I see things differently now, but I'll read it anyway. I do not have the human form that wins the looks or praise. I do not have a cunning mind to reap the world's ways. I have no things that auctioneers would eagerly appraise. My furniture is broken down. My house due for a raise. R-A-Z-E. -Z -E. I have no daughter, son, or wife, nor anyone who stays nor scintillating grown-up toys to fill the passing days. I do not work at bettering myself, small s, although it pays. I'm poor at gaining anything that robs me of his gaze. And taking money for a job that sells the soul and frays, the fiber of a moral code, is worse than, than flesh entrees. For cannibals eat animals because of their mores while modern man devours cash regardless of folk ways. But then he too concerns the meat of animals he flays. 
be they four-legged friends of his or human foe parfaits, F-A-U-X. If nobody were to entreat what carnal lust purveys, its blinding hold would leave the soul it currently dismays. I aim to swear off everything that makes for gross displays or curses me in any way through anything it says. No drug input, input or alcohol which for the time allays the growing pain of bursting heart that leads to where he stays. No cause to keep my mind intrigued, no cockamamie craze, and politicians' promises don't win my life's okays. The sights and sounds of outer life to which the spirit strays can only lead to taking more of that which tends to days. For when the senses fill themselves with that which Maya sprays, the path is blocked to inner life and God's enlightening rays. The only way to get away from living in this maze is to give up the very things which bind one to this phase. And that, of course, would have to be two very tough hombres who act as one and cheat the heart through dominant forays. That's why I'm striving to release my heart from what betrays the mind and its relentless wants, which constantly waylays, which serves instead the ego king in all it now surveys, my this, my that, my everything, on which its life must graze. Until, that is, one's inner strength, the grand fakir assays, and through his strength and timely grace, eventually defrays the price that one must reimburse while giving one a raise. This paradox of taking in while issuing outlays is life divine rewarding one who has no hope yet prays, who offers up his very head to he who surely slays. The one who takes from prostrate man what on his feet now lays and gives in turn the flower of love to fill his empty vase. So he who seeking everything will lose the game always, while he who hasn't anything must win, for he obeys. The secret then of getting out from under Maya's haze is to give in to Baba's wish without undue delays. By paying dues and heeding don'ts, the soul is stripped of glaze and freed from enervating gain which brings on its malaise. This one may then have everything, for nothing now can phase an ash-begotten bird of fire that rose in cinder grays. That's, that stays a light and glowing red, a toast that doth amaze those souls that can't, the, who can't yet cheer a god who'd set their lives ablaze. While living on as burning dust, this phoenix soul relays the freedom born of having not to slaves whose voice invades. And though that greedy voice attempts to blatantly rephrase the call that freedom fires forth and lovingly replays, eventually it heeds the call, that jackass self that brays, and sets a goal to silently take stock and reappraise. That's when one finds the countless veils, the stubborn ass crochets, and seeks the light of burning truth to see that it repays. Thank God he sets our lives on fire and kills our yesterdays, so that our new lives may take wing, as per the poet's phrase, the one that God alone is real, not Maya's false inlays. So give up everything for him, just as this verse conveys. Postscript. To have and to hold is to lose and grow old. Have not and be bold, then you cannot be sold. Go for women and gold, you'll be out in the cold. Break the possessive mold, you'll have treasure untold. So don't be cajoled by the lies that you're told, and you'll soon be enrolled in the have-nothing fold. <laughs> This one's called, No Other Way. I continually faileth thee, I continually faileth me. Still onward I go, a snail in the snow. How will I make it? Only by grace. There's no other way, I'm helpless in space.
<laughs> so if it's your pleasure, have mercy on me. There's no other way I can make it to thee. This is called premonition harbinger. My house shall be rebuilt, near time to leave the ground. Poison self shall wilt, soul self coming round. A death is taking place, the dying almost done. New life wins the race, now there's only one. This is called Then Was Then. My silent circus life so loud, amaze for zing and all forget. Begun and done, pain smile made one to last the past. I am too gone from place of no more once was. Oh, so oneness, cry me now, love it do I am. Amen. <laughs> And this one I wrote to a friend who was going to India for the first time. It's called Birthday. Dear Marilyn, joy to you on your birthday, born to love him, come what may. Free your heart to have it say, celebrating new life's way. Now's your time without delay. Within his, within his arms you've come to stay, to dance and sing, to run and play to give and take, to stop and pray. All mental garbage flushed away, his whims and fancies you obey. Maya's promptings cannot sway, a love made strong without display. Lifetimes with him and now a ray of perfect grace from, your, from his love spray. Born to love him, come what may, love to you on your birthday. And this is when I was asked um, to be a part of it. I think it was, it was a Silence Day program in the barn. It's called Om, a light poem. And it's about a Silence Day experience. Soft and warm I find your day, gently bathing mind away. Rich and languid breezes flow, refreshing lovers head to toe. Piercing light presents itself, golden force of perfect wealth. Eternal fragrance spilling free pervades the air so lovingly. This natural singing from your hand touches all in lover's land. We thank you in a silent way on this our master's silence day. And this one is called all for one and one for all, a drinking song. The sake wets the whistle of the word and drowns the lover in the sound he's heard. On wild wind, the song of wine takes wing and causes love-drenched pilgrims' hearts to sing. The weak are weaned of weaknesses by those who unearth through his blazing song what froze. They melt the ice of wayward, stubborn wills and fire the heart, so loving wine now spills. Thus wounded, weary souls are primed to serve, to pour the gift of wine in graceful curve. How wonderfully he wakens with his giving. From heart to heart he raises dead to living. A drunken choir will one day ring the world and sing on earth what heaven's angels hurled. We'll share his ways, a wassailing on high, while grounded in a love that will not die. This winsome song of wine, wayfarers croon, is God's pure light reflected from the moon. The lunar chorus worships well the sun by giving up its life to silent one. So join the singers, wallas of his will, and harmonize for all the world to thrill. His word, released for wake-up call, now spreading, denotes that heaven and earth are surely wedding. The age of wine is wooing all who dare to clear their throats and breathe in sacred air. Intone his rhythm with a warm refrain and feel the music of his glory reign. He manifests to warriors wagering all for nothing save to honor love's true call. Stand ready for his every wish and whim, 
then love becomes a joyous, prayerful hymn. His wafting word through melody is sown. In singing dust, its perfect pitch is known. To willingly bear witness from this post is pleasing to the one who loves the most. What more could we who lay down at his feet desire except to have this gift so sweet? For once in tune with our beloved's pleasure, there is no room for any other treasure. And though the worldly cry, not one but we, the time is nigh for God-man's rhapsody. Then one and all will serenade with love, the one in all who came down from above. There's a little backstory to this one, which was, um, I read it at an, an arty one evening, and I think it was a few days later, Eric came up to me, Eric Nadell, and um, he really liked the poem. And he's got a mathematical brain, and he appreciated the, the meter and all that kind of thing. And now, going forward to um, um, when Eric died, and I happened to be in India at the time, he had not yet died, and I was scheduled to read a poem in Mondali Hall, and I thought because he was in very rough shape and in a coma, I would honor him by reading this poem that he liked. And um, 20 minutes after I read the poem, Casey Cook came into Mondley Hall and said, um, Erico has just gone to Baba 20 minutes ago. So unplanned, we were all thinking about Erico at the point at which he died. Not supposing that the 20 minute thing is accurate. I also remember that as soon as Casey said that, Meru said very strongly, well first Casey said he's gone to Baba 20 minutes ago. Meru said he already had gone to Baba because he was, I guess, in the coma. And then, and then there was, everybody just became silent naturally in remembrance of Erico. It was a very natural thing. For quite a while, it seemed like it was a few minutes, we were all quiet. And then she said, uh, we're going to cut the program short today. But it was uh, touching that he was remembered. What a fine soul. So this is called, I Do Declare, Meher's Song in Three Quarters Time. And think about Baba saying that three quarters of the, the world would be destroyed. This poem came to me while I was on duty. Um, I was night watchman on the center, I was a substitute. At the time, there was not just someone sleeping in the caretaker's cabin, but there was someone making rounds all the time because we'd had some break-ins on the center back in the 1980s. So Jane Haynes um, um, had somebody who was a paid person to travel all night, and I was the substitute, and I did a 16-day night straight time. And while I was driving around in the pickup truck on the center in the middle of the night, this poem came to me. I do declare may her song in three quarters time. I always knew it'd be like this, floating in the lap of bliss, Destruction happening all around cannot touch your emerald crown. We are wrapped in silence by its gleam, caught up in a holy dream. We laugh inside and smile without. Happy tears flow all about. The world collapses in despair, so we are disburdened everywhere. Nothing left now but to sing, Alleluia to our King. Oh, now we're at the last poem in the book. It's called Roses Are Red. One rose awaits in silent sentry, one perfect flower in still repose. Red is the color that calls my name. Red is the merry choice for me. With a window world behind, 
with a rose bridge there to see. Now the last one waves good morning. Now the time has come for me. When the petals there have fallen, when the glass stands empty here, that's the moment for this heart surge. Then my time will be revealed. What will be will be for certain. Time will lose its ancient hold. Now's the time it bears repeating. Now the red rose comes to me. So, J. Baba. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to be reading poems from a, as I mentioned before, from a, a quote book that won't be in hardcover form, at least not in my lifetime, I don't think, called Fragrance. And these will be videotaped along with the notes. It'll be a bigger project um, and it's forthcoming. And um, I have another project after that that has not to do with poetry, but I'm reluctant to say what it is because I'm, a lot of work has to go into it before I begin it, I feel. Maybe I'll change my mind. So, Jay Baba. So, the other day I was reading selections of my poetry from the book Roses, a Book of Verse, and I thought I'd read the last one, but after the poems in the book, there are notes to the poems, and then there's an afterword. There's a foreword at the beginning and an afterword at the end, and the poem is called Afterward. And um, I'll show you what it looks like, and then I'll read it. Afterward. If I have displeased him and you by getting out of line, it's only that I'm not well versed in giving up what's mine. I've done my best to put in place the words he gave to me, so that our hearts may open wide and share love silently. <laughs> 